Folks, no matter where you are in the world, I hope that you are staying warm. Please get those space heaters going. I know it's expensive, but you gotta turn on the heaters. We're gonna make it through this winter together. And if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, then good for you. That's just great. Welcome to Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton, the weekly kickboxing podcast. This week, we are covering some rise fights from last week and the comeback career of Taiga. We're also going to be talking about 1165 bookings with Hiroki Akamoto, and we got a little bit of a podcast fight as well. There were some boys out there who were hating on me who need a little bit of a takedown. And then we'll get into some training routines of Muay Thai fighters as well. Folks, I was asking for your input last week, and the what people keep telling me over and over again is that I need to do a longer podcast i think the biggest issue is that on air i actually get kind of like when i'm when i can see myself on camera a little bit i try to talk very fast because i'm nervous and i always think people want me to get to the next point because i'm covering stuff that not everybody intrinsically knows so for a lot of people this stuff is new and i always feel like i need to make a point and then like reinforce it and move on as fast as possible to keep people interested. So what I'll try to do is cover a few more subjects, but also talk a little bit slower and uh, yeah, and maybe just do a little bit more personality stuff. So we'll still cover news and kickboxing and stuff like that and events just like we were in the past, but I'll try to cover some stuff that's going on a little bit more generally, a little bit more still in the world of combat sports, of course. Um, maybe just a little bit more personality stuff. And that's why I'm going to be talking about Muay Thai training a little bit this week. Um, But I wanted to start with something that's going on in the kickboxing world that uh, it's almost like it's, it's reached a, a climax on the story of, of kickboxing in one championship where for a while now, it seems like kickboxing of the sports in one is getting the least amount of love. I mean, from fans, but really from the organization more than anything else. And uh, like in the kickboxing community, one actually has some of the most talented kickboxers in the world, and it has some of the best weight divisions of any organizations in the world. It's just a matter of most of those fighters are not actively fighting. So I'd love to see more kickboxing in one. Uh, but this week with the news of Hiroki Akimoto, and I'll break it down and I'll talk about his his life and his fight here in a minute. But with the news of Hiroki Akimoto, you can see the kickboxing community just kind of throwing their hands up in the air of like, this was the time to really put it all together, put kickboxing, uh, especially in Japan, in front and center. If you want to push this person as a star, now is the time to do it. And I, I really do want to see kickboxing succeed in one championship because the organization are great people. The, everyone that I speak with at the organization, from the fighters to the uh, to the public relations departments, everyone there is so cool and respectful and so helpful. Uh, I do multiple Instagram pages, different YouTube channels, TikToks. Uh, I write for various websites, and on every single one. I feel a little bit lucky that I get to speak with one championship and get to work with one championship because I work with a lot of organizations and none of them are none of them aren't as organized as one and they're not as media friendly as one championship is. So I'm really grateful to have the chance to work with one like this. But I do want more kickboxing in one championship. And with one one six five coming up, this was the headline event coming up in Tokyo with Takeru. Takeru just sold out the Tokyo Dome in his uh, two fights ago, so he is a bona fide star in Japan. So if you wanted to put Japanese kickboxing front and center, you wanted to do it at this event. So let's talk about the ballad of Hiroki Akimoto. It has just been an odd career for Hiroki Akimoto. I wouldn't say good or bad at this point, just odd. The former champion, he didn't get a booking on the Tokyo event, And let's break down that odd choice and and look at the bigger picture a little bit. But I don't want to look back on his career in a few years and just see wasted potential because he was unable to get a fight. And it's not just one. Like, this happened in his entire career. It's just, just a weird kickboxing career so far. Hiroki Akimoto is a karate-based fighter and an ultra-talented athlete. His parents were karate instructors, both of them. And he was born into striking sports. He has been in striking sports for his whole life. He has earned dozens of karate titles all around the world. He's also collected titles in Muay Thai and kickboxing. 
He started out as a very promising fighter in amateur kickboxing. He switched to professional kickboxing and went on an undefeated streak. Most of his career, he was unbeaten. But at some point, uh, and this was when he was coming up in the like uh, Japanese Tokyo kickboxing scene. At some point, for some reason, we don't know the details, but every gym in Tokyo and every fight organization in Japan refused to work with him. And again, we don't know why he was blacklisted or or what this story was. We don't know the background, but even some of the insiders that I speak with say the same thing, that they just don't know. So we don't know the details on this. But during his prime athletic years, while he was on an undefeated win streak, he could not get a fight in Japan. He could not even train in Tokyo. So then he moved to Singapore. He joined one championship. He joined Evolve MMA gym and also became an instructor there. So thoroughly through and through, he was a one championship loyalist. After some wins uh, and losses in one championship, he's able to capture the bantamweight title against Kapitan in a legendary fight. This was one of the best fights in kickboxing history, and most publications had the Capitan versus Akimoto as their fight of the year. It was a legendary fight, and he was able to capture a championship. There was also lots of feel-good stories featuring him and his coach being Seher Baharzada, who actually used to fight in the UFC. Seher Baharzada, I think, was one of the only Afghani fighters in UFC history. But they put out tons of feel-good stories on these two gentlemen of how they worked together and accomplished their dreams against all odds. And it was a feel-good story. It was awesome to see him do that. His next fight, he loses the title to Pechtanong. Pechtanong is then busted for steroids and stripped of the title. So now you have a vacant title and a former champion. What would you do? Well, they didn't do that. (laughs) So instead, one championship decides to have the MMA champion Fabricio Andrade and Jonathan Hegarty, the Muay Thai champion, face off for the kickboxing championship. Um, And you can guess at whatever you want. I don't know what one looks like internally with these decisions. A lot of people think that they're trying to merge Muay Thai and kickboxing just to be striking. And from the looks of it, you you could see evidence of that to just muddy the waters. Even on Wikipedia now, the MMA is still separate, grappling is separate, but Muay Thai and kickboxing rankings have been merged. So anyway, Jonathan Hegarty picks up the title that Hiroki Akimoto used to have. We don't hear anything for a little while. 1165 is booked in Tokyo with uh, Takeru headlining, so it's a major, major star in Tokyo. Naturally, you'd want another Japanese fighter who has a good future kickboxing on that event to push more stars. And apparently they were locked in for Hiroki Akimoto to face Jonathan Haggerty for the kickboxing title. That would have been cool. That would have been absolutely awesome. But Haggerty pulled out of the fight due to injury. No problem. Like that, that happens. Little bit odd that he was booked two weeks later. So he had a very severe injury and couldn't fight in Tokyo, but it was a good enough injury that he could fight two weeks later. Like, it wasn't like two months later. I get that. I totally understand it. I'm not saying Hagerty's a lie or anything like that, but two weeks later, what? Anyway, so Hagerty pulls out of the fight due to injury. No problem. So instead, one championship offers Hiroki Akimoto a mixed rules fight against John Lineker. Hiroki Akimoto says no. He's a lifetime striker. He's never grappled a single day in his life. He would get submitted instantly by any MMA fighter during the MMA rounds. And there's tons of fighters in the kickboxing weight classes that he could have been booked against. He also could have signed someone in Tokyo that he could have been booked against. Uh, One Championship reportedly has 900 fighters on their website roster. There's tons of fighters that could have faced him in kickboxing. And he says, like, I am a professional kickboxer and I want to kickbox. A mixed rules fight is not something I want to do. And apparently they were negotiating for John Lineker to fight in a kickboxing bout. But again, like what this goes back to what we were talking about with mixed rules fight and people jumping across different sports is that it just doesn't add anything to his legacy. So John Lineker gets beat up in a kickboxing fight. What does that do for him? What does that do for Hiroki Akimoto that he beat up a guy who was unranked and has never competed in his sport before? Yeah, it's a cool little name and I get that. But it makes it look so circusy when there's so many mixed rules fights and people jumping across different sport lines to do these kinds of things. And now Hiroki Akimoto went public with it. And so he went public. He said no to a fight in one championship. And he's a kickboxer on top of that. So you add all those things together and you get something like the Anissa Mexen situation where one of your most talented kickboxers, one of the most talented fighters on earth, 
is not offered a fight or they're not offered reasonable fights. They just get offered mixed rules fights and can't get a fight in their own sport. And this this wasn't like a, a last minute booking kind of thing. They've, they've known for months that they're going to Tokyo. So I'm not sure why it was so rushed in the last few seconds there and why like we go from a mixed rules bout to no fight at all when it would have been great to see him on it. And again, like you could have just signed someone from some random gym there or brought in someone like like so many fighters debut against champions. Why would it have been so difficult just to find some kickboxer for Hiroki Akimoto to get a, a display fight on or something like that? Right. Uh, he said, quote, Hagerty had an injury and could not make the event, so I didn't get a contract. After that, there was talks of mixed rules or special rule fights with John Lineker, but I strongly discussed with one that I want to do a kickboxing match. At the end, there was also talk of kickboxing against Lineker, but I did not get the fight to the event. Uh, I cannot bend my ideals as a professional kickboxer. It is my philosophy that one needs to properly prepare and game plan before a fight, and to do that, adequate time to prepare is necessary. I think it's incredible to fight anyone under any rules at any time, but that's not what I consider to be a job of a professional. So that's a quote from Hiroki Akimoto's recent post where he went public about this. And we've talked a lot in the past about mixed rules fights and how uninteresting they are. They're fights without stakes. The loser loses outside of their sport. The winner beats someone who doesn't compete in their sport. The win doesn't matter. The loss doesn't matter either. And I know that we can look back at some mixed rules fights in the past and talk about how amazing some of those moments were. Like uh, Demetrius Johnson versus Rotang was cool. That was one. And then after that, none of them have been that cool. Uh, and even in the past, like you get something like Alistair Overeem versus Badr Hari. That was uh, a mixed fight at the time. But at that point, like Alistair switched fully into kickboxing and then they fought again and became a big thing. But essentially... Alistair Overeem was looking for a switch and he was a kickboxer before then. So it wasn't like a crazy out of nowhere type of thing. And speaking of mixed rules fights, they also booked Yoshihiro Akiyama, Sexyama, and Nikki Holskin in a mixed rules fight. Nikki Holskin being the former glory kickboxing world champion. Round one will be boxing, round two will be Muay Thai, and round three will be MMA. It'll all be in four ounce gloves. This win or loss doesn't add anything to either man's record. Like, Akiyama gets knocked out in a boxing or Muay Thai round. Well, yeah, he's never competed in those sports. Holskin gets submitted in the MMA round. Well, yeah, yeah, he hasn't competed in that sport. What does that mean? When you have this many mixed rules fights or super fights or people jumping across uh, different sport lines, it makes it look kind of like a freak show, circusy show. It's a martial arts organization and, and a serious one at that, not a circus. Could you imagine in the Olympics if you had your judo medalist fight a taekwondo medalist in boxing. Would that make sense? Because that's, that is exactly what this fight is. Would you have your Greco-Roman medalist fight a boxer in, I don't know, taekwondo? Would that make sense? Why not? It's a super fight. What if you had a freestyle wrestler wrestle a horse from equestrian? I don't know. And I do get that Akiyama is a draw. He's a good name, especially coming off the physical 100. Uh, he's definitely a ticket seller. I've, we've seen the numbers. He's, he's one of the ticket sellers. But why not just an MMA fight? Like, this is a catch rate at 185. Was Angla and Song not around? Like, Yushin Okami is signed? Like, these would have been great names to have, honestly, especially for a fight in Tokyo. And Nikki Holskin, former glory champion, there's no kickboxers in the world in his weight class that he could have fought against. But instead, both men have a, a fight with no stakes in it. Just saying, 1165 could have been a watershed moment in the organization and it is very main event heavy and the main event really carries the event and what we're going to remember but yeah the last fight the main event is really what we're going to remember uh let's take a quick peek at the rest of 1165 shinya aoki versus sage northcutt i mean shinya was built up in mma by beating up old dudes and now he's the old dude getting beat up uh, and i really don't mind seeing it because like he was <laughs> One of his fights was against Kazushi Sakuraba, who's a person who's just like been beaten uh, by like Ricardo Arona and Vanderlei Silva and these violent people. And he was booked against Shinya Aoki and Aoki was like, uh, he's like a 11th degree judoka black belt and a, a jujitsu black belt. So they were hoping that he wouldn't just beat the crap out of Kazushi Sakuraba. Instead, he would submit him. But no, Aoki just ran in there and punched the hell out of Sakuraba until they stopped the fight. And, and Aoki, again, we've seen the numbers. He's definitely a draw. And uh, 
This year, he's getting sent to the glue factory. So 1165 has one of the best fights in kickboxing history with Takeru and Superlek on it. And then the rest of the event is like the glue factory and mixed rule super fights. So it would have been nice to have something like Hiroki Akimoto to really weigh down the card with serious matchups that have stakes. And there were some other matchups added to the card, but let's do a live reaction, taking a look at the full event. In the main event, Superlek versus Takeru with the kickboxing title on the line. Awesome. That's an amazing fight. Cade Ruotolo versus Tommy with the lightweight submission grappling world championship. This is a rematch for a grappling title. I don't know. This is a kickboxing show. I don't <laughs> It's not the most interesting thing I've ever heard of. Shinya Aoki is getting sent to the glue factory against Sage Northcutt. Yoshihiro Akiyama and Nikki Holskin meeting at a catch weight of 185 pounds in a special rules fight. Marat Gregorian sticking on Sidichai. This is, I think, the sixth time that they fought. But yeah, Sidichai has won four of their meetings, and Marat has won the most recent one. Both are four, both are former glory kickboxing champions. It, it's a fine fight. That's a really good division that they have there. Gary Tonin is taking on Martin Nguyen. That's a good fight. That's a good fight. Danny Kinghead and Yuya Wakamatsu. Yeah, great fight. Itsuki Hirata and Ayaka Mayura. The women's atom weight is, is a very good division that they have in one championship, in all honesty. So that's, that is a good fight there. Raid Opacic will take on Iraj Azipur in heavyweight kickboxing. That's a banger. That's a really good fight right there. And then we have the last two fights being strawweight MMA. Bo Kang, Hirobi Minowa, and Gustavo Bullard, and Kito Yamakita. Those are good fights. Those are actually good fights. You want to see a little bit more action in these MMA divisions after they were kind of frozen for a year there. So overall, it's actually, it's a better fight card than I was giving it credit for. It's just some of the fights that are getting promoted, like the Akiyama and Aoki fight, uh, are, are not overly interesting. But the main event is absolutely incredible. 1165 is going to be uh, a banger. You, you know I'm tuning in. All right, let's take a quick break here and then when we come back i will be covering the rise 175 event thank you for listening to the calf kick sports network make sure to check out more interviews highlights and podcasts on the interview channels additionally make sure to check out calf kick sports on instagram links for all of these will be down below now back to the show Thanks for your time, folks, and I appreciate you being here. Let's move into last week's Rise fight card, which was Rise 175. I'm going to start with the co-main event and then go to the main event. But the co-main event saw Arena Kobayashi, the undisputed 2022, no one disagrees with me on this, female fighter of the year. She got a dominant knockout win against Ching Long Wang. This was, this was always a layup fight for her. Uh, it, it was, it, like, it, but either way, it was great to see a knockout in the smaller women's weight classes. Arena just has a ton of power in all of her punches, especially that left hook. That left hook was, was like a magnet. It was just hitting her taller opponent all night long. And like I said, even before the fight, this was kind of a display layup for, for Arena Kobayashi, and that was great to see. And let's jump to the main event. We had the Rise Super Featherweight title on the line. Taiga fought Chan Hyung Lee. Chen Hyung Lee entered the fight as the champion, uh, and he had defended this title, and all of his fights were exciting and incredible wars. He is just always lit. He is just, he is nonstop. He is an aggressive, action-packed fighter. And in this fight, you saw why. It, after five rounds, it was back and forth. It was an absolute war. Taiga got his hand raised. And it was a close fight. And uh, like different judges on a different day may have seen this fight go another way, especially because the round pacing was so interesting where one person would do very well early and then they would fade for the rest of the round. So Taiga getting his hand raised, uh, this was like a career comeback for him because he, he was at a point in his career where if he retired, no one would have held that against him. At one point out of 10 fights, he had nine losses. Like between 2017 and 2021, he had three wins but 11 losses in that time. And, and, and a ton of those losses were by knockout. He was also the second place in K1 Grand Prix. So he was kind of the, the second, even at his very best, he was like a second place kind of guy. And then he went after those Grand Prix losses, he went on a huge skid, just losing after loss, after loss, after loss. He wasn't doing well. And honestly, retirement would have made sense after consecutive knockout losses. No one would hold that against him. And then suddenly something changed. In 2022, he gets a win and then he gets another win. And in 2023, he gets two more wins. 
And they weren't easy wins either. These, a lot of them required the fight to go to extension rounds because it was so close. And then he got a title fight at Rise 175. And after five rounds of war, he got a title. He got a world title. He had to dig deep and push when he was down. He had to find new strength. He had to find new toughness. He showed resilience. All of these things, not just in the fight, but in his career as a whole. What a comeback career-wise this man has had. So it's incredible to see. And such a highlight fight, like it is the lead on fight of the year for 2024 so far. Absolute back and forth war. A memorable fight, but a memorable career overall. And he started quite a while ago. Professionally, he began about in 2012. So it's been more than 12 years. He started because he was inspired by Masato Kobayashi, the K1 legend. And I guess he is still young as well. He's not even in his 30s, so maybe the best is still yet to come, but absolutely good for him for making this comeback. He was just a middle-of-the-road fighter who took a bunch of losses, who wasn't taken seriously, who put it all back together again. And I love to see that. Those stories are so good. And that's what sports is often all about, is picking yourself up when you're down. Pushing yourself, taking losses, and mentally rebuilding yourself or physically rebuilding yourself. Because there's absolutely no shame in taking losses and then coming back from that. And it really shows his mental fortitude that you love to see in fighters. Like some of my favorite stories, some of my favorite stories in combat sports were often of fighters who struggled early on and kind of needed to sort it out before really finding their stride. People like George St. Pierre, Semi Schilt, even even Buakau as well, just had a very mixed career before finding success in kickboxing. Also looking at fights last week, you also had the Alexis Nicholas fight against Megomed Megomedov, which was a lightweight kickboxing bout, 170 pounds in one championship. This was on one Friday fights, 47. Really like this fight. Really like what I was seeing from Alexis Nicholas. He would plant his feet and throw in combination. He would mix punching combinations to the body and head, but most of his game was just those heavy, heavy leg kicks. And from the first round, Megomed was struggling and he was switching stances. You could see visual bruising on his legs from these powerful, powerful leg kicks. I'm really looking forward to seeing more from Alexis Nicholas. Oh, I guess he's from France. It's probably Alexi. Numpenga was able to knock out Sho Ogawa with an elbow and this knocked out a bunch of teeth from Sho Ogawa. It was brutal. They showed up for one second of his teeth coming out. There was a photo online later where his teeth are missing. Oh, it was absolutely brutal. Uh, but that's fight sport. That's Muay Thai. It's a brutal, brutal sport. It's stuff like that where I think, I don't know that I could have been a professional fighter. Fighters are quite often too tough for their own safety. Um, I, I work with one lady who I think was in Taekwondo championships or karate championships. And she's told me about how she broke her finger, but couldn't tell anyone because then she would be out of the competition. So she continued so she could fight in the competition. And, and stories like that are just so common for fighters. Jacare Souza, he broke his arm in a grappling competition, but just pulled it out of his opponent's submission and tucked the limp arm into his belt and just continued fighting. It's stuff like that where I think like, there's no way I could have continued. Or the Jerome LeBanner breaking his forearm, blocking a kick, but continuing in the tournament anyway. It's stuff like that. I get there's, that stuff hurts like <laughs> uh, Later that same night, we also had one fight night 18 with Sua Black getting a decision win against Stefan Karodi. This was a really good fight. Sua Black was knocked down early and he really needed to come back and rally. Sua Black, I do like. They're really putting the hard sell on him, but he seems like a really cool and talented fighter. Incredible, incredible thighs. I like when one fighter's selling point is thick thighs. So yeah, between the two one championship events last week at Lumpini Stadium, there was some very good stuff going on. Lots of good bonuses, lots of good knockouts up and down the card, and good fights thoroughly. We also had some announcements going on in Wulin Fang coming up on January 27th, uh, where there's various fighters who are announced to be fighting. Uh, Chinese fighters who will be fighting foreigners, but a bunch of the fights fell through because the foreigners were under contract with other organizations like like Glory <laughs> or One Championship. Um, so I'm not sure how th I'm not sure how accurate this card is going to be by the time it gets there. But you have people like Daniel Puertas fighting, David Curia fighting, David Mejia, Wu Young Fang. You have Jia Akoi. You have Lu Si. So it's just like various people. Some of them from one. Some of them from. K1, some of them fighting elsewhere. 
Um, so we'll see what this card looks like, but that's going to be coming up on the 27th. And, you know, if if it goes ahead as it is, it looks really, really good. <laughs> RWS Muay Thai is back live from Raja Damnern Stadium, and it's going to be headlined by a title fight for the vacant stadium bantamweight title. And it's going to be a rematch between two men, and it's quite a good fight as well. Kumandoi already has a win over Peng Tor, and now they're going to be rematching with a title on the line. I mean, Kumandoi, he was almost the 2023 fighter of the year. He was just one win away, got a loss in Rise Kickboxing, and, and is now back into Muay Thai, where he's been a stadium champion a few times before. Extremely, extremely talented fighter. I mean, he's already beaten people in his career. Like He's beaten people like Deselec, Petrosilla, Hercules ton of other people in Pang Tor. Uh, Pang Tor is coming in as a very decorated Muay Thai striker. He is a two-time Raja Dominant Stadium Champion, Omnoy Stadium Champion, Channel 7 Stadium, True For You Champion. So it's going to be a really decorated fight this weekend. People do ask, how do you watch RWS? If you are in Thailand, it's on YouTube. For everyone else in the world, it's on DAZN. Now, if you miss it live, it'll typically go up on the RWS Muay Thai channel pretty quick as soon as the event is wrapped up. So I think the event, like my time, it wraps up in like four in the afternoon. And most of the videos are on the YouTube channel by like five ish. And we have another competing kickboxing podcast who has called me out. I declared Arena Kobayashi to be the 2023 female fighter of the year. And there's another kickboxing podcast, Inside Kickboxing, they call it, who says that I'm wrong. So let's take a listen as to what these gentlemen have to say. It's loading. Yeah. And uh, plenty of people are mentioning her as the fighter of the year, in fact, uh, for women in general. And uh, I have a hard time agreeing with that, actually, because the only reason Arena is that successful this year is because she spent the entire year running away from Kuyuki Miyazaki. And I understand why she did that. She fought her three times and had zero wins out of it. But Arena, Arena, Arena. So folks, the Inside Kickboxing podcast is a, a really good podcast, in all honesty. It is put together by some of the experts who are the leading people at Beyond Kickboxing. And uh, these two people absolutely know kickboxing. Uh, Jin and Pico just are uh, kickboxing geniuses. And um, I quite often rely on them for kickboxing knowledge um so make sure to check them out uh, i mean look we we disagree on female fighter of the year we're looking at different reasons and it's it's fine like it's it's okay to disagree with these things in sport especially when you have a reason and we're not using twitter speak to hate on each other um like those are completely reasonable reasons that you know i would argue that past losses in different years don't matter on this year but that's just me uh, i think arena kobayashi had a really good year uh, she went up into a different weight class dominated everyone in that division including the champion uh, she, uh but yeah i think those were quite good wins i know that she lost to the lower weight class champion in the past three times um i just didn't include it because i i, I just looking at fighter of the year 2023 she had some good wins uh, and if you pick someone else for female fighter of the year, that's okay. You can be incorrect. I don't, I don't really want to argue about this, uh, but I will say, make sure to check out the inside kickboxing podcast. It is on YouTube. It is on Spotify and they're very good. And these people are experts when it comes to Japanese kickboxing. When it comes to things like rise and K1, these are the people that I go to and speak with to make sure that I understand what's going on there because they know this stuff. Um, so yeah, they get my full endorsement and, and more kickboxing podcasts are needed. These are not competition. We're all ships in the same tide here. So yesterday I uploaded a Tawan Shai versus super bond fight breakdown. And it was a video essay and in it, uh, like it took me an embarrassing amount of time to edit because I've never done any of that before. I had a pretty good image in my head as to how I wanted it to look. And I've never done that before. I've made some Instagram reels before or Instagram. Yeah. Reels, TikToks, stuff like that using CapCut. So I had a little bit of general knowledge about how to edit videos and I knew what I wanted it to look like. And it was largely kind of inspired the look by Sumo Soul, who is just an inc incredible YouTuber who once used one of my articles as a reference. So really proud of that one. 
But in doing that, I really did like the process. It was a ton of fun to make it and break down the fight and upload it. And the numbers have been pretty good. Not bad. I would like some more for how much effort I put in. Again, it was embarrassing to learn that stuff. I should get better in the future because now I know how to do it. I have a bit more of a system in place. But it made me start thinking about how to increase interactions on YouTube while doing very little work. So you want to work efficiently. You want the most output for the least amount of input. And I started thinking about like what subjects I could cover that would be very easy to put together. And some of it, one of the ideas that I was kicking around was training routines of Muay Thai fighters. Because Muay Thai fighters notably have insane and just absolute mad training routines. And it's also an easy video to put together because you're just doing videos of, of them training rather than fights that are probably on copyright. You know what I mean? And you can put some flashy ass title in it, like Bua Cow's insane training routine or Rod Dang's insane training routine and just talk for a while in it. But as I'm researching it, I figured I could tell you folks about it. So I, again, thanks for listening. Appreciate your time because these numbers are insane. And it's kind of the stuff that people talk about of like, this is one of the reasons why Muay Thai fighters don't have a very long career. Most Muay Thai fighters retire before they're even at the age of 30 because they start when they're like six years old. And their body, they fight nearly every week and then their body's pretty beat up from training and fighting. So they have to retire by 30. But most fighters do want to get out of Muay Thai just because it's a brutal sport. And like for an example, a very recent one, Petch Morikot was considered a veteran Muay Thai fighter. He had fought so many people and he had fought all around the world and he had fought for different titles and he retired with a very decorated career. And he was 28 years old. More than 200 fights, 28 years old. Rod Tang, same thing. What is he, like 25 now, 26? 370 fights. Like, insane. But yeah, let's look back at some of the insane training routines of notable Muay Thai fighters. Because when you put this stuff out there, it's just it's just crazy, crazy stuff. But let's talk about one of the old Golden Age fighters who was Apidej Sit Hyrun, who was known as the Golden Leg. And the reason that he was known as the Golden... Well, he, he was the man of the seven titles because he collected different Muay Thai stadium titles. He also collected boxing titles. He also got an award for being one of the Muay Thai fighters of the century. But he was known as the Golden Leg because his kicks had such a snap, such a whip to them, that the sound would fill the arena and spectators would be shocked. And, th and this rumor kind of spread, this legend spread, some more people came to the arena and Fightland has a really good story on him, Apadej. But legendarily, his kicks were so strong that he could snap his opponent's forearms. In 1963, he fought Sompong, and both of Sompong's arms broke, blocking kicks. And Sompong never fought again. So this is why he was considered the golden leg. But what was his training routine? It's funny because he, he, he was a coach at the Fairtex Academy, and he really stressed kind of the basics. Like he sounds like a very basic smart coach that you need to do cardio and footwork. Those are the two paramount things that everyone has to learn. But he himself would run uphill for 10 kilometers daily with iron weights strapped to his legs. So he was way easier on his students than he was for himself. But yeah, 10 kilometers daily with iron weights on his legs. How about Rod Tang Jim Wong Nong? Now, I'm not sure how, uh, I, don't, I don't know how recent this is, but at least in the past. Uh, so the story there is that he, 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 last year for some of its fights, like against Edgar Tabaras, he said he trained two days. If you look at the Instagram now, he doesn't seem like he's actively training. But when Rod Tang is really in the gym and really hitting his stride, let's break down what his workout would be. He goes jogging six days a week. Three of those days, he does 15 kilometers, and then three of the other days, he only does eight kilometers. So per week, he runs 69 kilometers. For you Americans, that means per week, he is running 43 miles. Uh, so he, gets, he goes out for a jog in the morning and then jogs to the gym where he does about 20 minutes of pad work, and then he does lunch. After a little rest, he goes back to the gym for the evening. He does 25 minutes of sparring, and then he follows this up with 40 minutes of pad work, and then finishes the day with a few rounds of shadow boxing. Just doing that for one day would absolutely knock me out, but he does that six days a week when he's in camp. How about legendary kickboxer and Muay Thai fighter Superbon? According to him, he, every single day he does six to eight kilometers jogging, he then does the heavy bag, 
which includes 100 reps of knees, 100 reps, uh, 200 reps of kicks, and then 15 minutes of teeps. He then does strength training, which includes things like jumping knees, dumbbell training, medicine ball, planks, uh, different deadlifts, kettlebell riffs, single, single arm dumbbell bench press, th- things like this. Just a ton of ton of reps. Then in the afternoon, he'll do about 15 minutes of jump rope, 15 minutes of tire jumping. I don't know what that is. Someone, someone in the comments tell me what tire jump means. He does shadow boxing for three rounds, pad work for seven rounds, punching practice for three rounds, heavy bag for three rounds, sparring for five rounds, and then clinch technique. But how many, like, how do you do this? This is insane. Buakao was another legendary Muay Thai and kickboxing fighter who had just this uh, incredible training routine. Apparently he got up at 5.30 every morning, which like, come on, I'm not doing that. So he would run six to 10 miles at that point, and then he would begin 15 rounds of pad work or bag work. He would then, after that, he would do strength and conditioning and then finish with clinch work and then finish with sparring. Oh, that's just the morning. And then in the afternoon, he goes for another run and then gets into another training program with 15 rounds and then finishes up usually eight in the evening and goes for dinner. I like one doing that one time. I think I would be dead for months, but these guys are doing it daily. But this is also why some of the reasons that people talk about uh, the fight game is exhausting, but you can lose a lot of years off your professional life doing that in the gym because you can do that as a young man, that kind of training routine day in, day out. I think if I was like 16 to 20 years old, maybe I could do that in my very best years. But after that, I'm just uh, there's no possible way, even as a professional trained athlete, like that's just an insane thing to do. So if you know of any other insane Muay Thai fighter routines that are just absolutely legendary. Put it down in the comments and let me know because I want to collect all of these and maybe put them in a video. But yeah, this is just insane stuff to read about. Oh man, I think even with edits, I've only I've not even recorded an hour, but I think with edits, this is probably 40 minutes or just under. I don't know how people like I cover such a niche sport that there is only so much news I can really cover. Like we're talking about Bua Cow in his prime just to fill time here. So I don't know. And there's like not fights every week in this sport. Uh, so, yeah, we really need some subjects to really pad out time here if, uh, if we want to do an hour here. Maybe we'll take a look at the big show, UFC 297. I'm so sorry. It's just, well, well, let's Sean Strickland is taking on Drake's Duplessis for the middleweight title. Just ridiculous. Middleweight is like the worst weight class. You could cut middleweight from the UFC history and... Anything after or before Anderson Silva really wasn't that important to the the overall MMA picture. But yeah, Sean Strickland versus Drikas Duplessis is not an incredible fight. But both men, I cannot predict either of their fights accurately. Every time I pick Drikas to lose and he just keeps winning. I pick Sean to win sometimes and I pick Sean to lose sometimes and every single time it's wrong. So I'm just not going to pick this one. Drikas probably gets it done. For the women's bantamweight title, it's Raquel Pennington and Myra Bueno Silva. I haven't been paying attention for a long time. What? I guess Amanda Nunes retired and Raquel Penning. Yeah, I guess Myra. Myra's really cool. I like Myra. Yeah, that's about it. That's uh, some other good stuff going on there. Mike Mallett probably gets a good win. That's pretty good. Arnold Allen versus Mosfar Evloev is a pretty good fight. Sean Woodson always brings it. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. I just, UFC, I think, overplayed their hand a little bit with like doing weekly events, but most of them you avoid. And then the main events, which are pay-per-views, become so watered down that they they almost don't seem worth it. So like, for example, the next big pay-per-view, which is weeks and weeks away, like there's a bunch of fight nights in here and most of the fight nights aren't that good. So you do fight night, fight night, fight night into a pay-per-view, but the pay-per-view, like Alexander Voskonovsky versus Ilya Taporia, great fight. Co-main event is Jeff Neal and Ian Gary. What? The fight's bad. I don't care. Marab Dwalish Willie versus Henry Cejudo. That is a good fight. But yeah, I think one of the problems, the UFC just overplayed their hand to the point where even some hardcores like myself were just like, there's so much better stuff that we can be enjoying out there. I've been hearing some rumors uh, that UFC 300 will be headlined by Bua Cow versus Conor McGregor. I have heard it, it will be a bare knuckle fight. It has not been agreed upon yet what the rules will be, but it might be a mixed rules fight. So first round might be just boxing. Second round will be just grappling. 
Third round might be Muay Thai, but only clinching. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, it will be a five round fight. But I, yeah, we're just waiting to see what the rumors put together there. Folks, I massively appreciate your time. Thank you so much for listening to Kick Weekly with Tim Wheaton. I'll be back at the same time next week. Make sure to check out the other stuff that we have on the Calf Kick Sports YouTube channel. Make sure to check out the Instagrams. All the links for all this will be down below. Folks, I massively appreciate... Oh! Oh, I forgot. Uh, the For the Glory Heavyweight Grand Prix... We have uh, the alternate is confirmed. So we now know that it's going to be Nordine Mehedin versus Benjamin Attic Bowie. This one was broken by yours truly. I was just the news man for this one. So if someone is injured, uh, the winner of Benjamin Attic Bowie and Nordine Mehedin will step in and they will fight on March 9th, the same day as the rest of the Glory Grand Prix. Okay, so folks, with that, I'm going to say farewell. Thank you so much for all your time. Appreciate you listening and I will be back same time next week. Thank you, folks.